What's up, Make Pop Music? It's Austin here from Austin Hole Audio and Visual and Make Pop Music, and we are back with another tutorial. And for this one, I wanted to do something a little different because we've done a lot of stuff on vocal mixing. We've even done like some vocal production and vocal stacking and layering and stuff, but we've never actually addressed the root of most of y'all's problems, and that is how to actually record a really good pop vocal. So. All of y'all are always saying in the comments that the vocal mixes that I'm doing sound so good because the vocal tracks coming in sound so good. And yeah, that's actually partially true. Um, but, you know, the mixing is, is really just the icing on the cake. It has to be a good take, it has to be well recorded, and it's gotta be in a good spot to even fit in a mix before you can actually hop into EQ and compression and tuning and, you know, stacking and layering. So today we're gonna actually just focus on the absolute basics and we're gonna talk about how to get a really, really good quality vocal take. And to do that, we're gonna be looking at a couple things. We'll look at how to set your input level, so how to set your gain, uh, where you're not gonna get any like super bad noise floor, but you're also not clipping. Then we're gonna talk about the mic position and proximity effect. And then we're also going to dive into just how to coach somebody through doing a good take. So we won't be comping in this video. We won't be tuning in this video. We did that on our last one. Uh, and we won't be doing any mixing. If you want any more information about vocal engineering in general, just go to our website, makepopmusic.com, because we do have a full two hour course on vocal engineering where we cover everything from picking a mic and interface to how to actually set it up, how to set the gain, how to actually coach somebody through a full take, how to compress it, EQ it, do spatial processing, how to comp a vocal, how to tune it. All of that good stuff is in that series. So for this one, I'm just gonna give you the basic rundown of basically how to set your mic up and walk somebody through an actual vocal take. So without further ado, let's go ahead and let's actually take a look at what a difference gain makes. So gain is gonna be your level coming in to what your mic is. And you can adjust that normally through a preamp or through your interface that has the preamps built in. So the louder you turn the preamp up or the gain up, the louder the vocal is gonna be. And I kind of like mine pretty loud. So what we're gonna do when we have a louder input is we're gonna reduce some of the noise floor and some of the room sound so we don't have to crank it up. Or when we go to compress it, it's not gonna bring up all of that background noise because it's really just gonna focus on the main waveform, which is substantial enough for everything to kind of compress right and to sit well in the mix on its own. And if you don't have it too loud, then you're gonna start to clip. And once you start to clip, you really can't get any of that back. You can clip in your DAW as long as you're all digital and nothing super bad is gonna happen unless you clip the output. But if you're ever recording anything, drums, guitar, anything like that that's analog and you clip on the way in, it's, it's done, it's ruined. So definitely don't clip it on the way in. It's better to be too quiet. But let's actually go ahead and take a look at too little gain and too much gain and you'll hear you know, the super, super huge differences. Let's go ahead and take a listen to what it sounds like when the gain is just way too low. All of these are tracked on the Loughton Audio LA220, just through my Apollo Twin. Nothing super, super special going on here. $250 mic, I think $700 interface. It is a little bit more expensive, but for years I rocked with a Focusrite Scarlett or a Personas Audio Box, so. Again, I just use this because it's convenient. The sound is not like exponentially better or anything like that. So don't feel like, you know, your gear is holding you back. As long as you have a decent, you know, entry level market interface, entry level market microphone, you should be good to go. But let's take a listen at what it sounds like when the gain is just way too low. So this is way, way, way too low. So I'm gonna clip gain this up like, I don't know, 24 dB. But listen to how much weird like background noise and just static and stuff we're gonna get. Baby, you got something that I need. And, and you'll really be able to tell if we add some kind of compressor. Let's just add like a 76 and then check this out. We'll just put it on like a vocal setting and then you'll hear it now. Baby, you Got something that I need. And I've been so you can see if we have it down here where we actually recorded it, we're not even really hitting that compressor. Baby, you got something. I'm either having to drive it super hard on the input on here or clip gain it up a ton. And not to mention, it's just kind of hard to see and it's very inconsistent. So I don't like my gain that low, but gain that low is better than gain this high. So this is actually clipping on the way in. And now no matter what we do, whether we compress it, EQ it, drag it up, drag it down, yada, yada, it's still gonna sound like shit and it's still gonna be clipped. So take a listen. Check, check, check. Baby, you got something that I need. 
So let's take a listen. For one, it's just super boomy and stuff because there's so much volume and gain. It's really capturing all that low end. But even if we drag it down to a safe level where those are pretty much, you know, comparable. And I've been trying to find the words, but I can't think. You're still getting all of that saturation. You're still getting that clipping. You're still getting that really, really gross, muddy ass low end and really, really just clipped disgusting high end. That's the easiest way to make a $250 mic sound like a $5 mic or a $5,000 mic sound like a $5 mic. It's all gonna sound like shit if you clip it on the way in um, unless you really, really know what you're doing and you're clipping it on purpose. So the gain, you don't want it to be too, too low, but you don't want it to be too high. I'd still rather it be too low and have to turn it up and you know just gate around and cut around background noise and hiss and stuff like that rather than have clipping. But ideally it would be somewhere in the middle of you know here and here. So like these were all solid takes. Uh, we'll get to those when we start talking about proximity and good take and bad take. But this is typically what I like my input to look like. It'll peak around like minus eight to minus six dB. Um, we'll just take a listen real, real quick so you can see what the gain should look like. I'm trying to find the words, but I can't think. So anywhere between this minus six and minus 12 right here, I'm typically cool with that. It gives me room to EQ it, compress it, do all the stuff I need to do. If I need to clip gain it up, I can. If I need to clip gain it down, I can. I've just got a healthy signal. So your gain settings will depend on what mic you're using, what preamp you're using, what uh, interface you're using, how loud your voice is, what kind of room are you in. All of those things will take it into account. Just try to make sure that you have a really, really healthy looking waveform that's giving you room to work with. You can always you know, clip gain it up, which is where I dragged it up or clip gain it down but you're never gonna get that clipping to go away if you catch it on the way in. And if your vocal is way too quiet, it's gonna have a lot of noise and room sound and just weird rumbly, hissy static in the background. And you don't really want that either, especially if you start having eight, nine, 10 vocal tracks layered up, that noise starts to really shine through in a mix and it can be super gross. So have your gain at a healthy level. That to me is tip number one, healthy gain is a healthy mic. The second thing you wanna kind of pay attention to is what we call mic positioning and proximity. So we'll talk about mic positioning first because they are two pretty different things mic positioning and by the way for all of the vocals on this we are using the Loughton Audio LA220 and the reason we're using this it's like a $250 mic I actually really like it and I like the LA320 which is their tube mic but I wanted to use this because it's a pretty affordable kind of budget level mic um, and you shouldn't have any excuses you know you should be able to use these techniques on a $99 microphone or on a $10,000 microphone setting your gain proximity effect and getting a good take will be the same no matter what mic you're using so for this we are just using the LA220 by Lauten I love it uh, it's a really, really good just FET condenser for anybody who's entry level or just needs kind of, you know, a cheaper mic to pick up just to have. Uh, highly recommend it. But let's go back into what we were talking about, about mic positioning. So we recorded all of the vocals and I always do in my control room, which if you've seen the studio tour, it's got acoustic paneling all around me. So it is pretty acoustically treated. Um, it's not a super, super dead room because I like a little bit of you know, kind of listening environment to get through. I don't want it super, super dead, like an anechoic chamber or anything like that, but it's not like a vocal booth. It's, it's pretty open. It's like an 11 foot by 11 foot room with treatment everywhere. And to me, it doesn't really let any room sound in. I don't have a lot of reverb. It doesn't sound like I'm in a bathroom. This is a perfect environment for me. If you're in the middle of a room that has no treatment, maybe put it in a closet that's got some clothes in it. Maybe put up some blankets and some mattresses just to block out any, you know, high-end room reflections, or you can always track it in something like a control room, or if you know somebody that has a vocal booth, a vocal booth. But try to put it in a room where you're not gonna get a ton of room sound, and try to put it somewhere in the room where it's not gonna echo a bunch. So I'm not gonna put it right against, you know, a plaster wall or a drywall wall or something like that that's gonna send back all of that, uh, you know, reverb right back to the mic. I'm gonna be recording it in a closet or something like that where something's gonna dampen that around me. Also, another tip is on your mic, some mics have the option and some mics are just one standard polar pattern, but you want to kind of look at polar patterns. And when you're recording vocals or something super directional, you want to go for something called a cardioid or a super cardioid or a hyper cardioid. And what that means is on the front of the mic right here, you've got a capsule and there's sometimes there's a front and a back of the mic capsule. And so when it's cardioid, you're only capturing from the front. So when I sing at it this way, sound is only going to affect that way. So even if it bounces back off the walls, it's not coming back into this back end right here. Sometimes mics have a figure eight pattern, which is where the front of the capsule and the back of the capsule is capturing. So that's really good if you want to use it on something a little bit more surround, maybe like a choir or maybe like a string instrument where you want some room or something like that. 
but for vocals, I typically prefer cardioid. And then there's Omni, which captures kind of all around the capsule. Again, good if you want some room sound, if you want a little bit kind of more open sound. But if it has a cardioid setting for vocals, I typically almost always set cardioid and that's gonna get rid of some of that background noise. So we're tracking in a room that's not gonna give you a ton of really, really harsh reflections. We're putting it somewhere in that room that's optimal to not capture most reflections. And then we're gonna put it on a cardioid pattern, which is really gonna only capture the front of that capsule. Those three things are going to eliminate a ton of room sound. That's already gonna clean your vocal up a ton. And then it's really about positioning the, the mic. And so with vocals, you typically want it to be about even with you know where the voice is gonna be. Um, so coming right out of your mouth and with acoustic guitars you can kind of play around Basically the sound source needs to have the most direct path to the actual capsule If you're not wanting any room sound or any ambient sound or anything like that So I would probably put the mic right about here if I was recording and now let's actually talk about proximity effect So proximity effect happens when the closer you are to a microphone It'll have more low end and then as you back off the low end will start to fade out and you'll start to capture more room sounds. So the best way for me to show you all of that is like actually just hop into the DAW and let's listen to an example of me kind of backing on and off a mic to hear the proximity effects. And let's take a listen to a take that was done close and a take that was done kind of far. So let's hop into that. So we're actually just gonna listen to this proximity example that I recorded. And I started about two to three inches away from the mic and then backed off to probably 14 to 16 inches away and you'll see kind of as we go, the gain of course lessens because you're getting farther away. But listen to how the tone actually changes. This track is gonna show you what we're doing with proximity effect. So right now I'm about two to three inches from the mic capsule and I'm gonna start slowly stepping back. And as I'm stepping back, you can hear that A, the sound is gonna get quieter because I'm farther away, but it's also going to get a little bit thinner because as I'm leaving, a lot of that low end return is getting diminished into the room. So we're gonna pick up a little bit more room sound as we move back here but we're also going to be thinning it out a bit. So if you find that your vocal is too, you know, bottom heavy or thick, maybe just move back a couple inches. This right here is probably about eight to 10 inches away. This is typically where I'll stand for my voice, depending on what mic I'm using. And if I want something really, really kind of in your face and intimate, I'll come right here. And if I'm doing background vocals or gang vocals or something that are a bit louder, I'll come back out here, which is maybe a foot, foot and a half away. So you can see the tone drastically changes as I go in and as I go out. Let's listen to what, uh, you know, three inches away from the mic sounds like in the mix. This doesn't have any EQ compression, nothing like that on it. This is just raw vocal take. This demo is about three to four inches away. Baby, you got something that I need. I've been trying to find the words, but I can't think. So to me, that's a little bit too close. I like close if I'm doing a really, really soft, like whispery vocal. Billie Eilish does it a ton. Like if you want her vocal sound, she's probably an inch away from the mic, just barely, barely, barely singing. She just probably sings like this. And then they just compress the absolute fuck out of it. And that's how it sounds so close and so um, just like in your face and tight and dry. But since this song is a bit more dynamic and the vocals are a little bit louder and just, you know, it's got a bit more movement, um, I stood a little bit farther away. This is probably farther away than I would normally go. I'd probably typically go somewhere right in the middle of these. But here's a far away take. This demo's about a foot away. And I've cranked the gain just so it's comparable. Baby, you got something that I need. Been trying to find the words, but I can't think. So I like this a lot better. It got rid of a lot of that muddy low end that we have in the close proximity one, which is gonna make it easier to compress it and EQ it. I'm not gonna have to scoop so much of that like 150 to 250 kind of tubbiness out of it before I actually drive it with a compressor. I'll probably just be able to go ahead and straight compress it. Let's do a quick little AB. Baby, you, baby, you got something. Got something. So you can see they're pretty drastically different. Um, you know, let's just kind of take a look at something like this. You'll see how much more low end we have going. Baby, you. you can see these big boosts around 200. And then here's the far away one. Baby, you. So we're still getting a little bit of boost, but it's not nearly as much. And they're a bit wider, so they're easier to control rather than these really like 
peaky resonances. So I'll typically stand like probably six to eight inches back on whatever mic I'm using. That just works really well for my voice and for all the mics that I kind of have here that are suited for my voice. So just play around with how close you are or how far away you are to the mic and that'll give you totally different tones. And you know, sometimes you might like, sometimes you might hate. And then it just makes mixing it a bit easier when you kind of know what you're getting yourself into. So now if you have your mic in your interface and you've got your gain set to where you're getting a healthy amount of gain and you've got it in a room and somewhere within that room that's not gonna capture a bunch of different room reverberations and you've got a cardioid pattern on it and you've got your proximity effect, the next thing to kind of pay attention to is getting a good take. Also, one thing that I wanna mention real quick is you didn't see me use it, but a pop filter is key. That's gonna really get rid of a lot of the pfft and the s and stuff like that. Uh, stuff that's really, really gross that you don't want in a vocal. I mean, a pop filter is like $10 on Amazon. There's really no excuse not to have one. So please pick up a pop filter because it will save vocal recordings so, so much. Um, but anyway, that quick little aside done, let's actually start talking about actually getting a good take versus a bad take. So in takes, there's a couple different things that you kind of want to pay attention to. There is tone, and you know, that's how chesty, how nasally, um, just kind of where they're at in their tone. Everybody knows what tone is. It could be anything like an accent, something like that. You want to just make sure that the tone is honest to the singer because honest tone is the best tone. I'd rather, even if I don't personally mess with the singer's tone, I'd rather than be honest to that and maybe just tweak it a little bit rather than trying to, especially in the recording stage, try to have them tweak their entire voice. So you want to make sure that the tone is consistent. If it starts a little nasally, it needs to be like that all the way through. If it starts kind of chesty, it needs to be like that all the way through. You just don't want it switching a ton throughout the recording because that makes it A, really hard to mix and B, really inconsistent to listen to. So tone is number one. Number two, I would say is going to be timing because uh, timing is pretty monotonous to fix. I just like to make sure that my singers are kind of in the pocket or when I'm recording, I'm just really, really nice in the pocket. Uh, make sure timing is as tight as possible. Do it as many times as you need to. And then once you have time and tone down, that's when I start worrying about things like pitch because we can always pit fix pitch a little bit later. And this is partly why I don't think pitch correction is like super cheating. I think that pitch is only one really small aspect to actual vocal recordings. I think you've got tone, you've got timbre, you've got pitch, you've got time, you've got enunciation, you've got emotion. All of those things are gonna come into play. So don't worry too, too much about the pitch. You just want it to be in the ballpark to where if you are tweaking it and tightening it, it's not going to sound artificial or disingenuine. Basically just make sure their pitch is solid and then make sure that their tone and their timing is solid. And then the other important things are things like enunciation. Can you understand what they're saying? Are they getting their point across? And then Lastly, and probably most importantly overall, because it doesn't matter if you record on an iPhone mic or a $10,000 Sony C800, is it's gotta have emotion. It's gotta feel genuine and it's gotta feel like they are singing about what the song's about. So if it's a song about you know partying and having fun, they need to genuinely sound like they're having a good time and they need to genuinely sound like they're involved in, you know, they want to be there recording that. If it's a song about heartbreak, they need to sound genuinely sad. If it's a song about anger, they need to sound generally frustrated and just pissed off. The thing is like we have to capture all these emotions in the actual vocal recording because vocals are the number one thing that people are going to listen to, especially in pop music. And if you can have that emotion, that kind of buys you a little bit of leeway if the pitch is not perfect or if the timing is not perfect or even if the tone is a little inconsistent, if they can feel it and it feels honest and genuine, they're going to immediately focus on the raw emotion because that's just human nature. So I would say emotion comes first. Next, I would say is tone. And then I would say probably timing and then enunciation and then pitch because pitch is the easiest thing to fix nowadays. So I focus on that last. You can always record a bunch of different takes too and comp them together. There's probably a ton of tutorials online about comping a vocal and we talk about it in our vocal engineering course. That's basically where you record a vocal, you know, six, seven times and then you take your different words or phrases from each take that you really like, put them into one vocal and then process that as one vocal. I typically don't comp a lot because I normally just record myself. I don't do a ton of engineering and I just like the way that I run through a full line better. So I'll typically go line by line or even verse by verse. And then that's kind of where I'll draw the line. I won't do a whole song in one take normally, but I also don't sit there and you know record the same section 14 times and then go back and just recomp and retune and do all of those things. I'll just get one good take to where I'm really happy with it and then I'll normally send that off. But let's actually hop into the DAW and as I'm showing you this, pay attention to the pitch, the tone, 
the actual timing of it, and just how you feel when you're listening to it. We're gonna listen to a really, really bad take, which is exaggeratedly bad. Just pay attention to what's bad about it, and then I'll show you something that I would consider like a passable take. It's not the best take. You know, I just recorded it pretty quick before this video, but it is solid, it's on time, it's on pitch. Um, you know, tone is there, so pay attention to those things when you're listening to this, and pay attention to those things when you're recording. So let's go ahead and hop in. Now let's go ahead and actually take a listen to a really, really bad vocal take, and this was intentionally bad, but the timing is fucked up, the tone is bad, the pitch is way all over the place, you'll feel nothing when you hear this, and just the absolute enunciation is just horrible. Everything sounds like shit on this, and this is absolutely what you want to avoid. Here's an example of a bad take where I move around, tone is not consistent, it's off time and off pitch. Baby, you got something that I need And I've been trying to find the words, but I can't think so if I was engineering somebody and that's what their first take sounded like, I would immediately focus on tone because tone is really bad in this. Uh, they're very nasally. I would tell them just to sing more from their chest, breathe in through their stomach and their diaphragm. And then I would tell them to just sing it a little bit softer. Like this sounds really closed and kind of like bitten off and sharp. Uh, so I would just tell them to relax a little bit, sing a little bit more, uh, you know, low key. So instead of thinking like this, uh, I would just ask for them to sing like this. Uh, and come more from here instead of like the top of your palate. That would be my first thing. Then we would kind of just focus on timing because there were some timing issues. And then really, really importantly, I was backing in and out of the mic. So the proximity effect is kind of all over the place, which makes this uh, insanely difficult to EQ, to compress, to do anything like that with because there's no consistent tone in the vocal. It's in and out. My vocal tone is changing. The mic vocal tone is changing because proximity is in and out. Timing is messed up. Pitch is messed up. And it just sounds like garbage overall. Uh, so that's what you want to avoid, and then let's take a listen to a good take. Not a perfect take, but it's a pretty good take, and we'll, we'll kind of discuss why. Here's an example of a good take where tone, pitch, time, and mic technique are all spot on. Baby, you got something that I need And I've been trying to find the words, but I can't think so this is good, we've got some dynamic flow. Um, I'm definitely feeling it and I am consistent and smooth. Tone is smooth and you can see with the waveform here, everything is kind of right in the same place which will make EQing and compressing it really easy because it's all kind of in the same spot. So tone was good, pitch was good enough, timing was pretty solid and then just actual mic technique was really, really good. I didn't move around a lot. The only time I would move back is like when I said trying. When you see these little peaks, I move probably two inches back just to make sure that we don't clip anything or to make sure that we're not getting way too much just absolute force into the microphone. So it's fine to move forward and back just depending on the dynamics of the song. You just don't want people, you know, rocking back and forth side to side all the time because it just makes it really, really hard to control. If they need to pull off for a big note or they need to come in for a soft falsetto note, that's totally fine. That's good mic technique. Just make sure that they're consistent with everything. And that pretty much does vocal recording. So we've got a couple things that we need to focus on. You need to focus on your gain, make sure that your levels are set and they're healthy. You're not gonna get a noise floor and you're not gonna get any clipping. Then you need to put the mic in a room that's not gonna get a ton of reflections, put it in a spot in the room that's not gonna get a ton of reflections, put it, you know, maybe four to eight inches away from your mouth depending on how proximity effect is affecting that vocalist and that mic. And then you really just wanna make sure that you have a cardioid pattern on so it's not gonna capture anything around the room if you're really just going for that tight up the center vocal. And then once you actually have the mic placed and you have the proximity set and everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing, you've got your level set, then it's just time to get a good take. Just pay attention to those five things that are emotion, pitch, timing, tone, and enunciation because those really are the key. And once you have one really good take, don't be afraid to go back and you know do harmonies, do layers, do some vocal production, do some vocal arrangement, do the things that are really, really fun. But it's always about getting that one key vocal that is the most important thing in recording. So so hopefully these tools and these tips have helped you. This is just a pretty basic rundown of how to get a really, really solid vocal. Like I said, you should be able to do this with a $100 mic or with a $10,000 mic. If you have a mic that is a condenser studio mic or even some dynamic mics and you have an interface that will plug into your computer, nowadays you should be able to get a passable recording. There is no excuse just besides bad technique. I've gone and I've done a solid mix with a $99 mic into a $99 preamp and it sounded fine. So don't use that as an excuse. Make sure that you're focusing on your gain. Make sure that you're focusing on your room. Make sure that you're focusing on your placement 
and make sure that you're focusing on the actual vocal and the equipment shouldn't bother you too much. Of course, nicer mics are gonna have more tone and they'll have more character. They've got more color, they've got more body, whatever, whatever, but just don't focus too much on the gear because you should be able to get a passable take on an iPhone microphone at this point. Technology has advanced so much, so hopefully these tools and these techniques and these tips will help you get a cleaner, just better, more well-rounded, solid vocal take so you can actually get mixing them, get tuning them, get tightening everything up, and you'll have a really, really good starting point. Like I said before, if you do wanna know more about recording vocals, engineering vocals, yada, 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 do check out our course on our website, makepopmusic.com. It is a bit more in-depth than this, and it does have a lot of other stuff like compression, EQ, spatial effects, comping a vocal, all of those really good things that are key for actually getting that good vocal sound in the final mix. So definitely check that out. Other than that, we will see you guys next time. Let us know what you want to see. Much love, make pop music. Peace out.